Where in the world do we start? Because, uh, you know, how much do I repeat? How much can we contain? I did the message last night in New York City, and that was the first time folks there had heard this particular thing that we've been doing and we did last week. And, you know, it's really, um, it's really difficult, I think, to contain all of these things. But let's see if we start here and try to somehow just put everything a little bit in perspective as to, you know, you know what we're talking about, uh, what does this mean, and what impact does it have. The most critical part of this is the connection with this constellation Pegasus. And what we found about Pegasus through the myth and, and so forth is that it's a white horse, which, you know, kind of gives us a description of it. Of course, it's a constellation. We know that from astronomer, astronomy. But it's a white horse, and we also understand that the father of Pegasus, I never know how to spell Poseidon, P-O-S-O-I-D-E-N, is it? Well, that's close enough. Okay, the father of, Pos of Pegasus is Poseidon, who is the god of the sea, which makes Pegasus a seahorse. Thus, Pegasus, if we look, it's a white, we know it's a constellation, we'll keep out of that for just a minute, that's a reality factor. But we know that that would make Pegasus a white seahorse. And, and, and that we can be content of, given the mythology. Well, this was written by the Greeks, so we have the understanding of, of where this stuff came from. What's curious about this is have we established a connection then between something in the sky and something in the human brain because what we have found and we understand is that in the human brain there is something called the hippocampus and the hippocampus is the part of the brain responsible for memory. And we found two things in our material. One was that it's a white eminence. That's how it's described in Stedman's Medical Dictionary. And two, that the word hippocampus means seahorse. So then the hippocampus in the brain is a white seahorse. And the constellation in the sky is a white seahorse. In the Bible, then, the sign of the second coming and the, the movement into this new consciousness is portrayed through the white horse. So we have the white horse of the Bible, we have the white horse of the myth, we have the white horse in your brain. What is interesting to me is if the hippocampus is the white seahorse in your brain, and if Pegasus is the white seahorse in the sky, would that mean then that there is a connection? Would that mean that the stimulation to memory in the human brain would come from the electromagnetic fields that would emanate from Pegasus. Because the two are exactly the same as far as being location. You have one in your head, and is this the memory bank of the brain? We know it is. But then is Pegasus the memory bank of the universe? Because they're both the same. And, and if they're, you know, in as much as they are the same, and then there is a white seahorse in your brain, and there is a white seahorse in the sky, why? You know, why are they there? 
Or is it just, you know, for no reason? Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. I, I never have been able to, to look at these things and say, well, you know, there, there's, there's no reason for this. So that, to me, is extremely important. And, and, and there's little doubt, and I don't think that we could get too much argument because there's no doubt whatsoever that this Pegasus is a white seahorse and the Hippocampus is a white seahorse, according to the medical dictionaries and according to the myths, we've got a match in your head and a match in the sky. And that's, that's interesting. The second part, which is so interesting, when the Bible comes in, it says that the sign that is going to be apparent to us that something big is happening would be in this sign of the white seahorse or the white horse in the sky. Well, that's Pegasus. Well, if that would be the case, then its activity would be in the white seahorse in your brain, which is hippocampus. So, in other words, there would be a reactivation of memory. The word memory, then, becomes a big part of this. There would be a restoration of memory. We would be able to, uh, you know, get back and, and and be restored to our original nature, however you want to put it. But I don't want to dwell in what if or what was. I want to get down to the to the nitty gritty here of what this is about. So, real quickly, because I'm, I'm trying to make this as simple, but it is so critically important that I'm trying to make it possible for you to understand without any question. There is a white seahorse in the sky named Pegasus. And the reason I say it's a seahorse is because the father of Pegasus is Poseidon. You do understand there is no such thing as Pegasus. There is no such thing as Poseidon. These things don't exist. These are all code words that have to do with the magnetism and the activity in, in the sky and the magnetism and the activity in your brain. There is a white seahorse in the sky. And that is a constellation called Pegasus. That particular constellation has been given that identity. Fine. There is a white seahorse in your brain called hippocampus. The word hippocampus means seahorse. Stedman's Medical Dictionary says it is white. On page 34, the stuff you've got, you've got a picture of it showing it's white. So it is a white seahorse, and it is responsible for memory. So the point when, if the white seahorse in the sky is responsible for memory, does it connect to the white seahorse in your brain which is responsible for memory? And is this what the Bible is talking about when it said Christ returns on a white horse? Is it a return of Christ consciousness which would be a return to the memory or the restoration of the self? Now, thinking about that, we moved on to something else that was critically important in, in, this, in this study. Let me take this off of here and if I could use this part. What we found in the story, now once again you have this Pegasus in the sky and you have this Pegasus in your brain and we've connected the two and we said they have to do with memory. And I gave you 104. If everybody has to have page 104, it is critical that you have page 104. Okay, we gave out all these pages. It's critical that you have page 104. What we found in the story, and remember these stories are, are, are written about scientific things, things about the mind, things about the universe. What we read in the story was that this Pegasus did something. As he was flying, his hoof came down and it kicked something on a mountain and caused a fountain to erupt. And this fountain was called Hippocrene. Now the important thing here is to realize that that fountain on Hippocrene began to become active when it was kicked by Pegasus. And remember, Pegasus in the sky, we have shown, is exactly the same as the hippocampus in your brain. They're both 
the white seahorse. All right. Pegasus kicks something on this mountain and causes this fountain to erupt with water. It's like geyser of water. The word hippocrene means horse fountain. Okay. So something. Now, the mountain where this horse fountain or hippocrene exploded from Pegasus is called, I can't write, it, Mount Helicon. So it was on Mount Helicon that Pegasus hoof kicked and caused this fountain to explode on the mountain. And, and you have all of this stuff. Now, on the mountain lived nine muses. And they lived there with Apollo. All right. What did we find that made this interesting? We found that the word muse, and you have that there, among other things, means the art of meditation. The word muse means meditation. In addition to that, it is the root of the word museum, which is the place of what? Memory. And what we found was that the muses were born out of an intercourse between M N E M O S Y N E and Zeus. This Menomosceny, who is the mother of the muses, and you've got in your stuff, is the goddess of memory. Okay. So what do we find? Pegasus is the white seahorse in the sky. We've connected that to Hippocampus, which is the white seahorse in your brain. If hippocampus is the white seahorse in your brain, then hippocampus in your brain is Pegasus. Okay. Interestingly, the Pegasus in your brain is the part of your brain responsible for memory. The myth of the ancients is that this Pegasus stimulated activity on Mount Helicon that caused the fountain, and that enamored him as a holy one to the nine muses, whose name means meditation and memory, and whose mother is the goddess of memory. When you think of this, and you realize what's being said here, you, you come to a conclusion pretty, pretty quick that inasmuch as the same people who wrote about Pegasus the white horse wrote the Bible, namely these Greek mythologists, there was a knowledge of the hippocampus of the brain being responsible for memory, and a knowledge that it is the stimulation of that hippocampus or that pegasus which restores memory, which restores the connection between universal or cosmic things and the mind. Now, how do we pursue that a little further? If you looked on 104, you'd see that the word muse means the art of meditation. As we said, it's the root of the word museum, which is a place of memory. The whole basis of meditation is to bring the energy in a spiral serpentine motion from the base of the spine to the pineal gland of the brain. Now, of course, you know, that 
takes us into the realm of Hinduism, and nobody wants to hear that in the Western culture. So we can't get very far talking about that, you know, on television to the people of the West. They don't want to hear about that. It does, however, equate to Revelation 5.1, which talks in the same way of this, this Kundalini factor, but still it's difficult. However, we don't have too much trouble in, in talking about the double helix, which is DNA, which is that spiral DNA. We're, we're all comfortable with that because that's a scientific fact. Also, in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, a statement in the Bible talking about the door to the holy place being on the right side of the house, which is as reasonable to, to equate with the right hemisphere of the brain. And then it says in that scripture that they, meaning entering, went up to that place with winding stairs. Everything is relevant to this DNA, double helix pattern, winding stairs, and so forth. And, and as I said, those of you sitting here have no trouble with the fact that the process goes up through the spine. Now, I had always thought in talking about that, gosh, you know, who knows if this really happens or not? And I, and I wasn't always sure that I could come in front of you and say, uh, you know, this, this type of thing really does occur, that the energy really does go up the spine and, and so forth. And uh, in, in looking, I don't even, in looking at that, I come up, if, if you have page 64 uh, of, of your material, there is something there from the New York Times by Dr. Alfred Lowy in, in an article called Hormones, um, published by Chapman and Hall. And it says, Understanding the Hormone of Darkness. Okay? If you look in the lower right-hand corner of that thing there, that picture of the, of the head, it says, After traveling through nerves in the spinal cord, the signal reaches the pineal gland. In the absence of light signals, the gland begins production of melatonin. All right? So here is this particular doctor talking about hormones, saying that the electrical energy drives its way up the spine. So I think with that, we could say there's a reasonable inference here that what the talk is through the Hindus and through the ancients of this serpentine motion uh, going up the spine is reasonable. And, of course, kundalini means the serpent, you know, the snake which, which you know, goes up and twists itself up. Yes? That serpentine motion is wider. It goes up through the whole body. Fine. Uh, uh, to That's body. fine. That's fine. I, the, the problem with it is, and, you know, who, according to who? I know, but that's not, you see, well, that's the problem I've got. And, and, and I appreciate, Bob, what you're saying, but that's the problem I got. Like, uh, I was told there was a lady in New York last night who was a, a New Age teacher, and she was telling me all these things, and I said, well, you know, I appreciate, and I, I'm glad that you do that, but my, when I say these things, I've got to prove it. Yeah. You see? And I can't prove anything using Hindu text. Uh, I can't prove anything using Christian text, really, and that's why all of the material that I give has neither Hindu or Christian text in it. it. You know, it has to be proved by, in fact, you know, the person that was there and I was showing them the transference of the teleportation of signals by Dr. Zellinger in Innsbruck, Austria, and that Dr. Zellinger uh, did not know how this happened. Now, th this is the man who, for the first time in the history of the world, teleported a signal a photon, from one place to another. Yet he couldn't explain how it happened. And, and this woman that was there last night, it was a new, you know, new age teacher, was, t was explaining to me how it happened. You know, that's not, you can't do that. Uh, science, when science is prepared to explain something, it explains it. All we can say for sure is that DNA is a double helix. That, they can show you a, a diagram of that. And so we could then say, based on this double helix, there is plenty of room to consider that the energy is rising in this body in a serpentine motion. That's why the Kundalini. Huh? It is? Yeah. Well, I don't know why that is. I... Yeah, the battery's good. Let me just 
make sure that this uh, thing is not getting back. Okay. So let's then leave that. Huh? I don't know why. I can't figure why that would be. Let me try. Let me try there. You still? All right. But, yeah. yeah. Just, maybe this is so directional that it has to be. Yeah, that shouldn't be, though. I'll have to turn like this, Mike. <laughs> Remind me to turn like that. I never heard of that before. All right. Okay. Um, but let's, let's go and say for the sake of this that inasmuch as we understand DNA as a double helix, that we could accept the fact of the serpentine motion being in that spiral pattern. And the reason then that we want to say that is because we'll go back to Pegasus who hit the top of Mount Helicon, caused the horse fountain to throw out the water, then connected him to the Muses. Pegasus is connected to the Muses. Pegasus is thus connected to meditation. Pegasus is connected to the Muses and meditation. And since the mother of the Muses is the goddess of memory, Pegasus is connected to memory. That's fine. The reason that this is important when we talk about meditation, memory, Pegasus, and all of this business is because the entire thing happens on Mount Helicon. And the word Helicon is from the Greek helix, which means spiral. So the Helicon is the spiral mountain, the place of meditation, the place of renewed memory, and is stimulated by Pegasus. And that's a significant thing that we've been able to determine here. In other words, everything that was written here says, hey, this has nothing to do with the mountain, in the same way that Calvary and Golgotha had nothing to do with the mountain. This has nothing to do with the mountain. This has nothing to do with muses. This has nothing to do with Apollo or monosomy. These are only words to take you to the point of a connection between something in the sky and something in your head. That it is that which is in the sky, Pegasus, which is spoken of in the Bible. And a second point that's critical here is the Bible says Jesus comes back in the second coming riding a white horse. Well, we have proved there is no doubt there is no question that the white horse in the human brain is the hippocampus. And the reason we know it is because it says it in the medical dictionaries and in the medical books. So how could Jesus then come back on a white horse? How could that be possible unless we could show somehow that there is a connection between Jesus and the hippocampus, or the pegasus inside of your head. In the middle of the hippocampus, and you have it on, in your stuff, in the middle of the hippocampus, and you can find that, I believe, on 13b, if that is, if I remember, there is no 13b. Oh, well, you won't find it there. 16b. In the middle of the hippocampus of the brain, and remember, hippocampus is Pegasus the white horse, is an organ called a mon's horn. A mon's horn. Another name, and you can find it in this material for a mon, is amen. In Revelation 3.14, that's... It always is neat for me to see this with my own eyes. If you have the Bible there, could you open it to Revelation 3.14? Last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking. Okay? Jesus is speaking. And in Revelation 3.14, he says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen. So in other words, Jesus is called the Amen. If Jesus is called the Amen, then he 
is in the center of the hippocampus because the main organ in the center of the hippocampus is Amon's horn or Amen's horn. Amen's horn means Amen's power. The power of Jesus is in the hippocampus. So the second coming would certainly be Jesus riding a white horse because Amen is in the middle of the hippocampus. Amen rides the white horse inside of your head. Certainly that's where it's going to come. But, but what I want, what you, did you say? I'm saying, oh. uh, in Revelation. Uh, well, you come out of here because nobody can hear you. In Revelation 3.12, it says, Jesus says that, um, I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Okay. All right. Fine, that's fine. And, and of course, the Jerusalem is, is, is the mind. So what we have then, what we have then, is the fact that the second coming of Christ is on a white horse, meaning Amon's horn in the hippocampus of the brain. The hippocampus of the brain is the place of memory, okay? And it is stimulated by Pegasus, the Hippocrene, and so forth and so on. So we then look with tremendous interest at the fact that a couple of years ago, in Switzerland, for the first time in the history of the world, the scientists were able to discover and discover a new planet, and it was located in the constellation Pegasus. I don't know what's the matter with that. I really don't know what's the matter with this thing. Well, not the, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, now, let's, let's just look for a minute here at what we're talking about. We're talking about mythology connected to the Bible, connected to the human brain, connected to astronomy, and we're looking at, at words that were written in a coded fashion that were directly speaking to the fact that inside of our brain is something that activated by this higher energy will restore our memory and restore us to things of the past. We found that Mount Helicon, the spiral mountain, is the place of meditation and restoration of memory through Pegasus. It is Pegasus that stimulates this. Remember that. That's extremely important. Nothing happened on Mount Helicon until Pegasus' hoof kicked it. So it's Pegasus that restores it. That's why this discovery of the, of the, of the um, planet in Pegasus is so critically important. We get two stories. We get two stories that tell us about what goes on here. One of the stories, and we told last week, and I'm dwelling on it, but some of you weren't here, but real quick. A beautiful young person, young fellow, who is totally enamored with himself. And everybody loves him, but he sp spawns the love and the approach of everybody. He wants no part of anybody. All he is concerned about is himself. All he is concerned about is the physical. And there was one little nymph that loved him so much, and her name was Echo. And so they said to him, look, the God said, you're, you know, you're too much. You're too absorbed with the physical. You've got to go to Mount Helicon. And they sent him to Mount Helicon. And at Mount Helicon, he spent days and days and days staring at his image in the pond at Mount Helicon. And he stared at it so long, finally he just wasted away and died. When the searchers went out, to look for him, they found where he had been a flower. And they took the flower and they named the flower Narcissus. Narcissism is a psychological problem in which a person is obsessed with themselves. 
obsessed with the flesh. And, you know, as the whole Bible and of the ancient days, you know, you've got to look within with the single eye. You can't look at the flesh. You can't look at the physical. You can't look at the traditional and all of these things. You've got to look inside at the God part and so forth and so on. So what happened? How was this problem taken care of? He ascended up the mountain, the spiral mountain, to the place of memory. He ascended up to the place of, of, of consciousness, of, of, of meditation, and there he was transformed. That which was the negative part was replaced, and he passed over the flower representing the new life. That which is old had passed away. Behold, all have become new this Narcissus became this beautiful flower, that which was always gone. And in fact, as an accompaniment to that, the little nymph who loved him so much, Echo passed away too, and she became a voice in the woods. Hello. Hello. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so there is a statement that ascending up the spiral pathway to the mountain of memory, where hippocampus allows the water to flow, pegasus allows the water to flow, will bring us to the point of moving away from that which is the old self to that which is the new God self or the flower. There was another story that we told that was interesting too. What is that? Oh, you were clicking me. <laughs> there was another story that was interesting too, that, that talked about the same thing. One of the muses, one of the nine muses, now, now, now understand what the nine muses are, there's no muses, you, you realize that. How many cranial nerves do you have? Twelve. Nine of them are the muses. Three of them are the cyclops. Okay? The cyclops are the three points, of we'll get to that, but I just want to let you know. That's what they represent. One of the nine muses is named Calliope. You know what a Calliope is? You know, you, you ever seen the, you know, the silver pipes and they play music like a little piano and the steam comes through and it goes, boop, 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 you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, <laughs> Calliope uh, gave birth to a son by the name of Eurydice. Excuse me. Calliope gave birth to a son named Orpheus. Orpheus married a girl named Eurydice. He then played on the lyre of Apollo. The lyre is this like violin or banjo or harp. If you look in Stedman's medical dictionary, you'll see the word lyre. L-Y-R-E means Lyra Davidus, which means the fornix of the brain. Enough of that now. Eurydice died at a very young age, and Orpheus pined for her. And he didn't know what to do. But he would play such beautiful music on the lyre that it said the rivers and the streams would stop and listen to him, and the trees would bend toward. And so Orpheus said he had to go and see the one who held the keys to the underworld where Eurydice was. So he went and he saw Hades. And he played the lyre and Hades said, you know, oh, I'm sold. Go down and get her. Bring her back up. You can have her. Problem is one. As you're coming up this dark, winding pathway up to the sun... Never look back. If you look back, you lose her. So Orpheus went down, and he was coming up the dark passageway, winding through the rocks. Following him was this beautiful Eurydice. And just as he was about to get to the point where he would come back up into the sun, he just wanted to make sure before, and he turned, and she fell back into the abyss of the underworld, and she was gone. That winding dark pathway is the spiral. And what is being said there is once you start ascending up that spiral pathway to the place of the new sun, never look 
back. And the Bible says once you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Don't look back on your old religious beliefs. Don't look back on your old traditions. Don't look back on your old nationalities and your old family beliefs because once you do, it'll pull you right back and you'll start to doubt and you'll start to think about the old things and you'll start to question and you'll fall right back in. And that spirit of yours, which is Eurydice, which you're bringing up out of the dark place, which is the lower concepts of the mind and the flesh, will fall back once you begin to look back to the old ways. Don't look back. Another one of the... Um, Muses was Urania. And Urania is the muse of astronomy. And of course, you see the word Uranus there. For those of you who hadn't been here, of course, you know, when you go into Christian churches and they, they deny all of these things because you know, they can't see that what they're studying is actually mythology. Even though they say amen at the end of the... I, anyone I've ever asked, they would refuse to agree or understand that the word amen is indicative of amen, Ra, the Egyptian sun god. They say, oh no, that means so be it. It doesn't mean so be it. Amen is the name of the Egyptian sun god. But one of the muses is the muse of sacred song. And her name is P. O L Y H Y M N I A. Polyhymnia. And she's the muse of sacred song. And so if you take the poly away and take the IA away, you've got the word hymn. And we'll all sing hymn number 475. Just a closer walk with you. And but tell them the next time. Hey, do you know that's a that's a muse. <laughs> it's the chocolate muse, you know. <laughs> but it is. That's where it comes from. Everything is a myth. When you look at a, when you go in a church next time, I don't know why you would, but if you go into one of those places and you look and there's a book and you'll see it's it's the hymnal. You just tell them, oh, it's not the hymnal, that's the poly hymnal. <laughs> well, poly finds out that you left half of her name on. So you, you can end up getting a book in mythology or, or whatever, however you want to look at it, and, you'll, and you look at the nine muses and you'll find who they are. And one of them is polyhymnia. But the, what I want to tell you about Uranus is this is an interesting one. As Uranus, the word Uranus means son of. Now, son of. This is son of man. There were the 12 titans. The 12 titans were responsible for creation and so forth. Who was the very first titan? You're going to say, oh, I asked last night, who was the very first titan? The fellow said, Adam, before Adam. So it was somebody before Adam. The person who existed before Adam was known as chaos. You've met chaos, I'm sure. <laughs> but chaos was before Adam. Out of chaos was born Gaia. Out of chaos comes creation. Gaia, the mother, came out of chaos. Gaia gave birth without intercourse to Uranus. If you look in the, in the New Testament in Greek, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word for heaven in Greek is O-U-R-A-N-U-S, Uranus. The kingdom of Uranus is at hand. Uranus was a decent guy. But he and Gaia had intercourse and gave birth to Kronos. Now, this is all inside, but this is all to do with the sky. 
Let's say these are the sky gods. The other name for Kronos is Saturn. And that Kronos Saturn is the one that you are afraid of called Satan. Okay? Well, Kronos married a girl named Rhea, R-H-E-A. And they were having kids all over the place, but Kronos had this problem. He was afraid that, you know, one of the kids was going to overthrow his kingdom, so as Rhea gave birth, he ate them. One at a time. <laughs> this last kid was a brat. I got an interjection. But anyhow, he was eating all the kids. Well, she was about to give birth to Zeus. And what she did, she took a stone and she wrapped it in swaddling clothes and gave it to Kronos and he ate it. And she took the little baby Zeus and they ran to the Isle of Crete and hid the child until the danger had passed. Yes, it is the origin of the story of the wicked king who was afraid of the little child and killed the children. And so they little took the little child to Egypt <coughs> and kept the child there until the danger had passed. And yes, it is the story of the beautiful mother Devaki who gave birth to the little baby and the wicked King Kansa was afraid that the child was going to, so he killed all the children. So they took the little child out across the ice flows and hid until the danger was passed, and the little child was Hare Krishna. It's all the same stuff. It is just amazing to me, as you understand where this stuff comes from, that we all honestly think that our tribe is the only one that's got it. You know, this is our story. Because we, we, and you know why you think it's the only story? Because they don't let you read the other story. <laughs> don't read that. Now you know why they don't want you to read that. Because it's the same thing. And in each of these cases, Jesus returns and puts Satan under his feet. Zeus returns and overthrows Kronos. Krishna returns and slays Kansa. It's all the same stuff. See? It is all the same stuff. And here, of course, how could it be? You know, the little baby Zeus was taken off to Crete. The little baby Jesus was taken off to Egypt. And the wicked king tried to kill the little baby Zeus. And the wicked king tried to kill the little baby Jesus. And the Zeus came back and overthrew the wicked Kronos and Jesus came back and overthrew the wicked Satan and Zeus rode the white horse Pegasus and Jesus rode the white horse and Pegasus carried the lightning bolts for Zeus and Jesus says the coming of the Son of Man will be like lightning. And it's all the same stuff. It's all the same story. It was interesting because what happened, um, Kronos belonged to, to the race of gods known as the Titans that I, I told you about, and is actually Saturn. All of these stories never happened. None of them. They're talking about the positions of the planets and how it affects the human mind. See? And so when it says in the Bible that Jesus comes back and they cast Satan into the pit, that means that Saturn goes down into the lowest part of you know, the universe. And then Uranus the son of man becomes the ruling planet. And then it says, they cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Basically what is being said, that the deception to the mind caused by the magnetism from Saturn. But then it says, 
till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed for a little season, because what will happen is during a period of time, Saturn will return in its position to that you know, position of the magnetism that affects the mind. Saturn will po- return to that position, and Uranus will be moved for just a short period of time. So it's all talking about astronomy. See? And, and it says in the Bible, in Revelation 22, talking about Jesus, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and he bound him for a thousand years and threw him in to the bottomless pit. See, so Satan, in this case, is in the pit. And astronomically, that Saturn is positioned at the lower position there. But if you look at that same story, so we have Satan in Revelation, and Jesus comes along, pulls Satan, and drags him down to the bottomless pit. This is talking about astronomy. Now let's look at the, at the Zeus story. Zeus was hidden in Crete in the same way that Jesus was hidden in, uh, in, in, in Egypt. And it's talking about the relation of planets, okay? But anyhow, when Zeus got old, he came back, and with the aid of Gaia, who is the Earth, he forced Kronos to throw up all the kids he had eaten. Well, you know, understand this. He also threw up the stone. The stone was brought to Delphi at the point of the oracle at Delphi, which is the fornix of the brain. Okay? Then Zeus and his five brothers waged war on Kronos, and Zeus was assisted. Now, how was Satan overthrown? How was Saturn overthrown? Zeus was assisted by two. H-E-C-A-T-O-N-C-H-I-R-E-S. Pronounce it. Hecatonshires, whatever you want to say. And the Cyclops. The Cyclops was the single eye. The power of the single eye. What is very extremely important when you understand how all of this comes about, when you talk about the Cyclops and you talk about the single eye and you look at Supernova 1987, the Cyclops is back. Uranus is back. And the overthrow is about to take place again. So what happens is, if we remember the story, Jesus overthrown Satan, cast him into the bottomless pit. The Cyclops had been kept in prison by Saturn. When Zeus came back, he freed the Cyclops. So the second coming does what? It brings, which is the power of the single eye or the pineal gland, out from the bondage where it has been kept by the systems. I mean, all of your life, what did you know about the pineal gland? All of your life, what did you know about the single eye? All of your life, did you know it had any effect? And you knew nothing about it because it was kept in the dungeon. Now, all of a sudden, it is back. It has been set free. The power of the single eye has been set free. And then, when the power of the Cyclops were set free, Kronos and the Titans were confined in Tartarus, T-A-R, T-A-R-U-S, which is a cave in the deepest part of the underworld. In other words, Jesus comes back and throws Satan into the bottomless pit. Zeus comes back and throws Kronos or Saturn into Tartarus, which is the lowest part of the underworld. It's the same story. And it's talking about none of this. It is talking about the alignment of planets changing, Saturn, Pegasus, and all of these things changing, which would then cause this electromagnetism. And you've already seen it. What has happened? Exactly what it says has happened in the myth. The Cyclops has been set free. 
The single eye has been restored. The pineal gland has been restored. The flow of melatonin has begun again. Is the flow of melatonin that which is uh, on Hippocrene? Is it the fountain of Hippocrene which is allowing the melatonin to flow again? It has been set free. It has been restored. And then the next thing that occurs is that Satan or Saturn is thrown into the lowest part and then we are set free. Now, Tartarus, if you just give me another minute, was the lowest region of the underworld, and Tartarus, Tartarus is synonymous with the word Hades. Which, you know, people say, oh, it's hotter than Hades. Well, it's going to, well, you know, it's hell. Uranus had banished all of his rebellious sons there, and the Cyclops was there. Tartarus was born through an intercourse between air and Gaia, the earth and the air, and this lower place was born. And there's a grove of, of black poplars along the ocean streams that marked the place of Tartarus. There was an entrance to Tartarus. Like this. And you had to cross a river to get there. And the one who controlled it was named Styx. Now listen, and I'll let you go. When you get to this river, listen very carefully, there is a grayish-looking man. And the grayish-looking man wears a short coat. He chooses his passengers from among the multitudes of dead that crowd the shore, but he will only choose the one who has a silver coin placed in the mouth of the corpse. Silver is the mind. Gold is God. Now, Sharon will then ferry across the river to Hades. The man, the grayish color, in the short cloak. Do you remember a person named Samael. Now, what's this all about? What is this about? This scare the pants off. The planet that connects to Hades is called Pluto. There is a satellite of Pluto, which is a very small, grayish planet, and it's called Sharon. Pluto, Saturn, the Sun, Pegasus, all of these things, all of these stories are written about this interaction. We have Saturn, we have Uranus, we have Pluto, we have the Sun, we have Gaia, we have supernova, the sky acting as a catalyst of magnetism. And you're probably wondering, well, who were that big name you put on there? The Hecateshires. I'll only tell you right now, and then we'll go on, that they had, there was three of them. And they had 300 hands and 150 heads. So figure that out before next week. <laughs>